Okay, hello Xtraders, and today we are going to change it up a bit. And instead of looking into options, option Greeks, selling calls, buying spreads, etc., we're going to take a look at company fundamentals. Remember that when we talk about options, I always, uh, according to the trading strategy, uh, which I will link to here in the video. Um, when we look at options and specifically at a chart of the ticker that we're looking to get into, uh, we look at technicals like fundamentals and support and resistance level. So the longer out you go with these uh, swings and leaps, the more relevant the fundamentals of a company become and the more irrelevant the market jitters or um, you know tantrums uh, between uh, data points and uh, you know FOMO and FUDs and things like that, uh, the, the, the more irrelevant those become. So let's go ahead and jump into company fundamentals. Okay, what I look for, um, and basically what I'm trying to do when I'm looking at fundamentals. Also, I believe this is the perfect time to cover this topic because. The stock market is about to, or could, be pivoting between bear and bull market, uh, but it's not going to be a bull market like the 2020, 2021, where these high growth tech companies became superstars. It's going to be a more modest uh, uh, bull market where certain companies that actually provide more solid and more conservative and more long-term sustainable uh, value are the ones that are going to come out on top. Okay, so it's not going to be 50, 60, 100 percent growth like in the um, in the uh, uh, after the pandemic boom recovery. It's going to be a different, uh, probably more conservative uh, kind of bull market, and it it, uh, it is a good actually a perfect time to jump in and get a lot of uh, value companies at good prices because they have basically deflated along with the big growth stocks, right? If you look at uh, the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ has done and is still doing pretty terrible. Uh, so, but that has deflated, that's because a lot of those high tech growth companies got deflated on, in 2022, but it brought along with them for the ride a lot of high value uh, more blue chip companies. So it's a perfect time to jump in and this is where fundamentals uh, play a big role. So value. Well, why is a company valuable? You know, uh, and I actually left this open on purpose because there's a lot of different definitions of value. So why is a company valuable? Okay, so um, a lot of the ways that analysts analyze companies for value uh, we have a couple of examples here. One of them is uh, based on how much cash the company can produce. And this is known as discounted cash flow. And basically what it means is how much cash flow does the company have over the next few years? And it, it doesn't go out to infinity, although it can, but basically the farther out you go in time, the less reliable the numbers are, just like a weather forecast. So they get um, a lot less weight assigned, okay, but the cash flows in the next maybe five, ten years, those are the most important ones. And so those are the cash flows that analysts try to identify, all right? So basically you take the cash that is produced in the future, in future years, okay, and you add them all up. But the thing is that the cash produced in today, in this year, 2023, is a lot different than the one produced in 2033, 10 years from now, because 10 years from now, as you all know, the time value of money, and if you haven't ever covered or seen this topic, then I will try to find a link to a topic here. But basically, 
one dollar today is a lot more valuable than one dollar tomorrow okay and that's related to the fact that well you can actually prove this to yourself if you go back in time and when your parents were kids you know coca-cola probably ran you know cost them about 25 cents right? you can't get a coca-cola for 25 cents nowadays and whatever rates the different analysts use to discount those cash flows is what makes the difference between what Jeffries, you know, says, what Goldman Sachs says, what Bank of America, what Deutsche Bank, and all these, you know, all these different um, analysts say uh, or think that a company is valued at because they project their revenue, they project their growth, they project their earnings, and then they discount all of those cash flows back down to today and say this is what they're worth. But uh, basically, every analyst has a different opinion on um, not only on projections for growth and revenue and earnings, but also on what discount rates to use to discount those future cash flows. So that's one way, and it's one of the most common ways, the discounted cash flow. Um, another one is the enterprise value, and that's basically how much cash it, ha cash it has you know, right now. Well, how is it valued, the enterprise value? So what you do is you take the balance sheet and you look at the balance sheet and then uh, you basically figure out how much a company has. Okay, so all assets are obviously valuable, and then however much debt, which is on the on the uh, liability side of the balance sheet, um, and I'll link to a video on that topic here. But basically, um, however much debt you have is something that is owed, you know, to somebody else. It doesn't really belong to the company; it belongs to uh, whoever gave you the money. So basically, whatever you have. You know, so you know the cash that you have minus the debt that you owe. Then that's basically how much real cash you have today. Uh, and then there are others. There are other ways of valuing companies that are much shorter, much quicker, um, such as taking the earnings per share and the uh, price to earnings. Uh, there's also sales to earnings in the case of some companies that don't produce um, profits. Uh, such as EPS, you know, or have negative EPS, you have to figure out a different way to value them. So let's look at some of these, um, you know, some of these company parameters that we can look at, and let's compare two of the giants. All right, so Apple and Tesla, they're both high tech growth companies. Uh, they should both um, uh, have a lot of similarities, but they also have a lot of difference. Here we're looking at Apple and Tesla. Uh, and you can get these, um, you know, these data points from, uh, I believe I got them from Yahoo Finance, but they're on basically every finance site available. Um, sales and revenue. So let's compare the two. Apple, we're talking $394 billion, whereas Tesla is $74 billion. So that's about, um, what, five times bigger, you know, uh, revenue, money coming in. Um, and this TTM means trailing 12 months. So that's important to keep in mind because a lot of these parameters are sometimes reported as TTM, which is trailing 12 months, which means that Apple made $394 billion in sales or revenue during the past 12 months, which is trailing. Um, and it's comparable to Tesla. But sometimes uh, it's not uh, trailing 12 months. Sometimes it's a forward 12 months. So it's something that's being projected. Um, all right, so we can uh, get get a better idea for the difference in size of revenue. Uh, EPS, so earnings per share. Uh, after the revenue, you need to take out, obviously, all the costs, and you're left with earnings, and then you divide it by the number of shares outstanding. And in this case, again, you have uh, $6 for Apple and $3 for Tesla. So that's actually a very good... Uh, I would say indicator because we're talking about a much older company here in Apple and they're only at $6 per share, right, in uh, earning. Whereas Tesla is even with one fifth the amount of sales revenue is producing $3 in earnings per share. So that could probably be due to the fact that the margin on whatever Tesla sells is a lot bigger than the profit margin in uh, uh, everything that Apple sells and that also makes sense because as you grow more revenue streams you diversify uh, and there's basically a trade-off between revenue streams that are riskier but produce a lot more margin versus those that are more conservative but they produce a lot less margin so your margin might eventually actually drop as you get uh, bigger uh, in the case of uh, the 
long-term, long-standing blue chip companies. Uh, whereas in the beginning, you might actually have a bigger profit margin because you're a lot, a lot more risky. So you're able to reach $3 in earnings per share quicker, uh, Tesla being, you know, however many years old, I don't know, um, seven, 10 years old. I can't remember how old the company is, whereas Apple is, you know, older than I am. So uh, that's actually quite impressive on the, on the side of Tesla. Then uh, obviously this is a big difference. A older company with a more solid, conservative and stable revenue stream will be able to produce or pay a dividend, whereas Tesla or a high growth company that has to burn through a lot of cash and invest in research and development and production and facilities, and um, uh, they, they don't have, they might be collecting a lot of money, like in the case of, of Tesla for sure, but that doesn't mean that they get to keep uh, a lot of it. They actually reinvest it right back into the business, so there's no money left over for shareholders. This is obviously something to look for in value companies because their stock might not go up and down as much, but a dividend could be a nice way to um, offset maybe a company that only grows 5-10% a year, but uh, you know, in the value, but gives you uh, an extra uh, in, in income such as dividend. Okay, so then you will also find in the uh, financial statements, financial statements, the cash flow, which in the case of Apple is under 22 billion, and in the case, and these are operational cash flows, um, and then in the case of Tesla, it is only 16 billion, so about 10 times less. Okay, so Tesla is left with very little money in the end, and these are operational cash flows because there's also financial cash flows which are different. Um, but operationally speaking, uh, look at all the money that. Uh, Apple produces on a yearly basis. I mean, that's a crazy amount of money. Uh, and then you have the debt to equity ratio. So uh, in the case of, I believe this can't be, that has to be 26.1. I'm going to check that out. Okay, so uh, in the case of Apple, it's 26.1, whereas in the case of uh, Tesla, it is about 14. Okay, makes sense because Apple... Um, Apple is an, a much older company, whereas Tesla uh, went uh, basically made all this money by uh, a, a lot of financing that it got from venture capitalists and from investors, institutional investors, uh, as of recently. So they don't need to resort to a lot of more, to a lot of debt as compared to somebody like Apple when they've already used up all the money from the investors and they basically have to go and, and get, mon uh, get money from uh, lenders like banks. Okay, uh, The profit margin, this is actually uh, surprising based on what we set up here, but Apple is 25, has a 25% profit margin whereas Tesla has a 15% profit margin. Uh, so basically Apple makes a lot more money um, you know, than Tesla does whenever they produce and then sell one of their products. Uh, they also produce a lot of software here, so that might have something to do with the fact that it's not being um, uh, assigned a cost that is um, altogether true, whereas Tesla produces mostly hardware. So uh, uh, you compare hardware, which has an absolute fixed real cost as uh, compared to something like software or even content created in a lot of the uh, uh, the places that Apple makes money, such as the App Store and the music business and the streaming business, and then your profit mar uh, profit margins are allowed to be a lot higher. Um, and let's look at shares. So Apple has 16 billion shares compared to three of uh, Tesla. <clears throat> also makes a lot of sense. Apple has had more time to grow, and therefore produce or basically print out more shares, accumulate more value. Um, and institutional holding is 60% uh, compared to 45%, although that's not that different. And the short, uh, so the percentage of shares that are short in the market is 0.77 as compared to 2.8 in Tesla. This makes a lot of sense. Tesla is a lot riskier. A lot of people short it. Um, and that is basically what, uh, why you have that difference in short percentage. And now we have here market capital, uh, market capitalization or market cap of Apple is two trillion compared to 388 billion, which is about one sixth 
the top, the amount. Uh, enterprise value is 2.1 billion. Uh, so you can see how it's very similar, uh, two different ways of valuing companies. Uh, and here as well, 388. Uh, versus 373. Now look at the PE. So the PE we have 21 compared to 38. So the price that you pay for the stock of Tesla is 38 times its actual earnings. Whereas the price that you pay for Apple stock is 21 times that earnings. So higher PE companies, uh, you want to be careful with that because the higher the PE, the more expensive the stock is. Down here, we have PS5 and PS6. And no, these are not PlayStations. This is the price to sales ratio. So when a company does not have earnings, which is not the case in, uh, for either Apple or Tesla, obviously, um, then you have no other option but to look at price to sales. So what is the value of the stock versus how much they sell? Uh, which is, you know, the best approximation you can get to the actual PE. So we've already seen that PE is a way to say, or to uh, to gauge how expensive a stock is compared to its earnings. So the price of the stock divided by the earnings. So we have here 21, for example, for Apple. And um, when a company does not have earnings, you know, because it's not making any money yet, then you can resort to the price to sales, which is the price of the stock divided by the revenue or the sales. Um, another way uh, or another number you can look at is the price to book ratio. Okay, so the, the P to B, um, which is meaning the, the book value, right? So what's in the books? What is the value of what's in the books? Uh, and in this case, for both of these numbers, we have a five and a six. So it's pretty similar for both Apple and Tesla. Uh, but of course, these are not <clears throat> you know, so important because PE is usually much more important, uh, basically because it's closest to the actual uh, discounted cash flow uh, value for the year uh, than what the price to sales would be. Uh, but, you know, if you don't have earnings, then you got to go with price to sales or price to book. Uh, and then we have the enterprise value, which is another way of valuing how much the company is worth divided by... Um, and you have two options, either the revenue, so this would actually be EVR, sorry, and this would be EVP uh, for profit, which is actually, um, let me go ahead and correct these. Uh, I just use it because it was a lot shorter to say EBITDA. So, so um, you can use these two uh, numbers, EVR and EVP, as a way to... Um, also gauge the idea of how much the company is valued divided by how much it's, rev it's revenue in this case. So for the EVR, what we're saying is that Apple is uh, is five times more valuable than its revenue, uh, which is uh, the same actually for Tesla, which is uh, quite interesting. And the um, it is also 16 times, Apple is 16 times more uh, valuable than its actual EBITDA or profit. Okay. Uh, so those are also measures that you can use. And like I said, you can find these on Yahoo Finance. Uh, I've got some charts over here, and we're going to jump over real quick to Yahoo Finance. Okay, so that's basically what all of those values are. Um, you can also look at uh, analyst recommendations. Like I mentioned, sorry, I just realized I skipped that. Uh, another thing that you can look at is the number of analysts covering these companies. When a company is new, then they won't necessarily have a lot of analysts. They probably won't even have any analysts. Okay, so uh, like I said, another thing that you can look at are the recommendation trends, which is very, very common. Originally, they only gave you like what is the current actual, you know, at this moment recommendation. Is it a buy? Is it a hold? Is it a sell? And, uh, and then now you can actually track it, uh, how it has evolved, uh, evolved over the past few years or the past few months. So in this case, we're looking at uh, how many analyst recommendations uh, for strong buy over the past four months, how many for buy, how many for hold, et cetera, et cetera. And um, they, sometimes they'll just, you know, they'll give you the, the wording, you know, buy, sell, hold. Sometimes they'll give you a number. Um, that's not really material. Uh, and But more importantly, they will give you an analyst price target. Now, this is important. Analyst price targets, in this case, which is 
uh, let me see, it's, it says average is 174. It, it means that actually the current is 129. So that is the current analyst price target. Uh, that is whatever the analyst is actually um, uh, forecasting for the next 12 months. Okay, the, the analyst, if this were only one analyst, and it isn't, it's actually 41 according to this number up here. But if this were actually um, uh, one analyst, and you can go in and dig in and look at the individual analyst uh, recommendations and targets. So let's say Morgan Stanley covers this. So Morgan Stanley is saying that the current price target that it has is 129, which is attainable in the next 12 months. Okay. Uh, in this case, this is obviously Apple. Um, it's not going to be, sorry, actually, I don't know if this is Apple. I didn't cut out the, yeah, it is Apple according to my slide. So uh, this is what they are saying that Apple is going to be worth over the next 12 months, 129. And in this case, they have an average because it's out, it's actually an average out of the 41 analysts that gave price targets. Okay, uh, In the case of Tesla, the current uh, price target for Tesla is 113, which is um, whereas the average of all analysts is actually 226. Uh, and then upgrades and downgrades. You can go in and look at uh, the different, in this case it was Wed Bush, uh, in, this case, in this case it's Misuho, and they have, you know, all the different analysts are going to have uh, not just recommendations and price targets, but they're also going to say based on that, well, I'm upgrading this company or I'm downgrading it. You know, if they see it, you know, it'll start to uh, to taper or da taper off, and then uh, start looking kind of bearish, then they, they'll go they'll go ahead and downgrade it, or obviously the other way around, they'll go ahead and uh, upgrade it. Okay, so those are important, and um, e there's a couple other things that you can look at in, uh, and we'll, we'll jump into this right now. Some of them, uh, one of the ones that I like is uh, historical misses. Uh, so the the beats and misses on earnings, uh, which is uh, it gives you an idea of how uh, how often uh, the company has met, has beaten, or missed uh, EPS forecasts, as well as uh, historical earnings and revenues. So let's go ahead and jump into uh, Apple here. And this is, uh, yeah, this is Apple for uh, Yahoo Finance. And like I said, you, you normally when you punch in you know, your ticker, you'll be taken to the summary. The summary does give you some of these numbers. will give you market cap, PE, EPS, which are probably the most important ones, and then dividends because a lot of people, uh, a lot of people like to look for dividends. But if you go over to statistics, you'll see a little bit more uh, detail of some of these numbers that we looked at on that uh, slide, like the market cap, the enterprise value, enterprise value by revenue and by EBITDA. Uh, you'll see the price to sales and price to book. Uh, you know the uh, historical price movement, the share statistics, we looked at shares outstanding as well as <clears throat> as well as the short, you know, the short ratio, how many were shorted. Um, you can look at um, the earnings per share uh, and you can look at the debt, the debt to equity, remember we talked about, and um, and actually, here it is. Look at this, 261. So it is 261. It's not 26.1. So let me go ahead and fix that because I actually changed it because it looked too big of a number. So that is kind of scary. I mean, 261, you know, debt to equity, that means that you have uh, quite a bit more debt than you have equity. But then, of course, if you're making $122 billion in cash flow per year, then you know mm, that's not that bad, um, and and debt is actually a good thing up to a certain point. And you can look at a lot of other statistics here. Here's the historical data I was mentioning. You can go ahead and look at. Uh, okay, so no, sorry, this is historical data for the actual uh, stock price. Um, I think it's in financials. Um, so there you have uh, for the past uh, few. Uh, end of the year. So this is ending September 2022, 2021, 2020, 2019. So you can look at, you know, has how revenue has gone from 260 to 394, uh, how EPS has gone from, you know, 299 to 567 and probably 614, but they haven't closed that. So that's probably why they haven't reported it on, uh, on Yahoo Finance. And you can see here is what I was talking to you guys about the historical 
beats and misses. So this is Apple. Uh, it's known for beating. So here uh, it beat, here it beat, here it beat, here it beat. You know, it never missed, even though um, a lot of other companies did. And uh, Q4, which is in February, is um, I guess is coming up. So we'll uh, definitely find out uh, in the next couple of weeks. And uh, here's the chart that I was presenting to you guys about, you know, uh, revenues and earnings. Uh, so, and I believe the analyst recommendations are probably going to be in here. So there's there's a number of analysts covering. So look at the number of analysts covering covering Apple. So uh, in 2022 and then now in 2023, it jumped like 10 analysts. You know, so that's obviously a positive sign. I mean, if you know, 10 more analysts are looking at your uh, performance, then you're obviously doing something right. Um, you can look at EPS over a year ago, revenue, how many, um, what the revenue estimates were, and the normal number of analysts covering that, what the EPS uh, uh, projections were, what the EPS uh, trends, the growth estimates, etc. And there's that chart about the uh, recommendations and upgrades and downgrades. You can go ahead and look at all of those individually if you want as well. So this is where, uh, this is actually one of the nicest uh, places, even though it is, you know, Yahoo is kind of old uh, for some people, but um, I, I like to get most of my company information from there. So wrapping up, how do we use these fundamentals? Okay, so basically what we're trying to find out is, yes, we can go ahead and jump into an option, not so much caring about, you know, the company's future. So for example, right now, and we're talking January 14, 2023, <clears throat> I wouldn't mind jumping into options um, about, you know, uh, on Facebook or even Tesla, simply because there is, um, there is no big risk from, uh, from my point of view. Uh, there is no big risk to what that company, you know the future of that company holds if I'm trading options because they are very short-lived so uh, but if you're going to be looking at some uh, more as an investment as a medium or longer term then you definitely want to look at uh, you know further down the road and uh, as ba as back uh, as far back in history as you can to see what it has done with revenue with dividends, with earnings, uh, EPS, uh, and all those sorts of things. So has this company performed well in the past compared to the present? And how stable are not just its revenue, but its earnings as well? What is being projected about its future? So we saw very quickly here that y you can look at the projections, right? Uh, what they are projecting the revenues are going to be, the earnings are going to be and how many analysts are covering it. Because again, like I said, this is basically you know giving you a seal of approval if you have a lot of analysts looking into you because analysts are not gonna waste their time on companies that are not worth looking into. Um, who holds shares you know, and how many shares? We looked at uh, institutional holdings versus retail investment holdings. Uh, institutional investors uh, will move stock prices a lot more uh, than retail investors will. Although recently with the social uh, media that has changed a bit, uh, a lot of retail investors uh, got into a lot of shares and actually moved shares more than institutional investors did. And we saw that with uh, the meme stocks like uh, GME GameStop and AMC uh, and Bed Bath & Beyond when these retail investors were basically uh, going against these big hedge funds and uh, trying to you know uh, take their take their lunch and they did uh, so uh, who holds how many shares is definitely important and are those shares or you know the company so the price of the shares the p uh, as in as in p to e or the company as in ev are those overvalued you know is the pe too high then am i paying too much money for the shares or is the evr or evp uh, enterprise value over uh, uh, revenue or profits is it telling me that the company is itself is overvalued so uh, how much cash does it have you know debt to equity and cash flow because a company that has more cash uh, and specifically more cash flow is going to be able to weather a downturn a lot you know, a lot better than a company that has less cash flow 
uh, and again uh, how much debt so those are some of the most important factors that we can look at and uh, will help uh, in our decision to actually go into a company stock you know common shares for the medium or the long term this is not day trading this is not scalping definitely this is not even two to three days swinging this is more um, uh, long shares we're talking you know uh, three months six months out okay so that is basically what we look for in uh, company fundamentals and I hope that this has been instructive for you so I hope to see you in the next one and have a good one